This is a vlog, I'm just here to talk. Uh, I'm first going to start off with subscribers on YouTube. Um, I've fastly had a little breaking point in the middle of nine subscribers where I slowed down and didn't get very many subscribers. This might look like a harmless teen, but he is far from it. Aaron Campbell is a vile, cold-blooded monster who committed one of the most heinous crimes in the history of Scotland. All I thought about was killing her once I saw her. You told both Dr. McPherson and the social worker in some detail what you did. You said that Alicia was drowsy and became a bit more awake when you went outside. At one point she asked who you were and where you were going. You said you were a friend of her father's and that you were taking her home. A crime so vicious that even the police officers and members of the jury were traumatized and had to undergo therapy. I have never before seen a police officer almost break down in the witness box. So affected was he by the sight. So what exactly did he do? And why did he target poor Alicia? What was his motive? Let's find out in the devastating case of Alicia MacFile, the innocent six-year-old girl who was violated and killed by a two-tuber teen. Alicia McPhail was born in Glasgow, Scotland to her parents Georgina Lochrane and Robert McPhail. Her mom and dad separated when she was just three months old and she stayed with her mom in North Lincolnshire while her dad went to live with his parents on the Isle of Bute. Alicia also had a younger sister Courtney whom she was pretty close with. At six years old, Alicia was in second grade at Chapelside School where her head teacher described her as a smiley and happy young girl who loved being at school and enjoyed all aspects of literacy, in particular, writing. She was bright and inquisitive, and her favorite activities were gymnastics and cake baking. She was also in the school plays and loved making YouTube videos. She dreamt of one day becoming a YouTube star. Hey guys, it's Alicia, and today I'm gonna to show you all about pasta, such as this. This is a pasta that so first of all, pasta is a food. Everyone knows that. Despite her parents being separated, Alicia's dad was still very involved in her life. The Isle of Butte is a scenic island with beautiful beaches and many exciting things to do. Alicia loved going there to visit her dad and grandparents every other weekend or on school breaks. And in the summer of 2018, it was no different. Six-year-old Alicia had gone over to the island hoping to spend three weeks of her school summer break with her dad and grandparents. When she arrived, she went to go highland dancing, but by the time she reached the club for the session, it was over. Instead, her grandparents arranged a trip to the beach, which was one of Alicia's favorite places. The day was eventful and fun. It was like many others she had had before in the past, but as the day drew to an end, it was time to head back home where the family spent the rest of the night together. The next couple of days would be packed with more fun and exciting activities, with Alicia having the time of her life on the rides. Sadly, this enjoyable, fun-filled vacation would end in tragedy. On July 1st, three days into her visit, Robert said that he put Alicia to bed around 10.30 p.m. with a DVD of Peppa Pig playing. 30 minutes later, Robert's girlfriend, Tony McLaughlin, who was staying with them at the house, went to Alicia's bedroom to check on her and found her sound asleep. So she left and went back to her room to lie down. At around 6 a.m. the next morning, Robert's father, Callum, woke up for work and decided to check on his granddaughter. But to his shock, the bed was empty and his granddaughter was nowhere to be found. He immediately woke everyone else in the house and they started checking around the house for the little girl. And when they could not find her, they called the police. Alicia's mother, Angela, also posted on Facebook asking everyone everyone to help her find her granddaughter. The search for Alicia immediately began with police and locals desperately scouring the area around Alicia's grandparents' house. A helicopter hovered over the wooded areas while coast guards checked along the shoreline. Almost the entire community was involved in the search with everyone hoping that Alicia had just wandered off and would be found safe and sound. But their hope would be crushed in the most devastating way. At around 8.54 a.m., a local man called the police to report that he had found a naked, lifeless body of a young girl in the woods. The girl turned out to be Alicia. Her body was in a wooded area of an abandoned hotel, 20 minutes walk from her grandparents' house. Her pink polka dot pajama shorts and white vest were found discarded a short distance away. She had suffered unmentionable horrors and sustained 117 injuries, 
on various parts of her body. An autopsy found that she had died of forceful pressure to her face and neck, and that she had been brutalized in the most horrific way, both before and after her death. A pathologist described her injuries as catastrophic. The post-mortem examination that was carried out earlier on today had just finished uh, within the last few minutes. Um, what I can say is that I confirm now that uh, the body recovered at Arbeg Road uh, is that of six-year-old uh, Alicia McPhail, um, who was reported missing around about 6.25 on Monday the 2nd of July. Uh, what I can say now is that uh, we are treating her death uh, as a murder investigation. The horrific murder shook the tight-knit community of Butte, with many struggling to understand how such an awful thing could happen. It's a lovely, lovely place. It's a, a really good community where people know each other, at least by sight, just over 6,000 people. Um, and this sort of thing, we have no context for it, so we're stunned. But imagine this, no one informed Alicia's mother, Georgina, about what was going on, or that her baby was dead. She had to find out on Facebook after she saw a post from Robert's mother, Angela. In an interview, Georgina said she woke up that morning with a feeling in her stomach that something was wrong. She would normally video call me, she didn't that day, but I thought as she had been to the party, she must be exhausted. She described how she tried contacting Alicia's grandma to see if she could talk to her daughter, but got no answer. I woke up the next morning and said to George, I really miss Alicia. I missed her every time, but that was intense. I missed her as if I hadn't seen her in years, and I couldn't get the feeling out of my stomach. I logged onto Facebook to try and call her Gran in Rothsay at the back of 9 a.m. I said, Hiya, how's Alicia? But never got a response. I went back on at 11 a.m. and I noticed I had two missed calls from her at around 8.50 a.m. That's when she saw Angela's post saying Alicia was missing. At first, Georgina thought that it was a bad joke, but when she saw the comments, her heart dropped. Frantically, she left a comment on the post saying, someone tell me what's happened, that's my daughter. Then someone posted a link to the article that said the police were searching for the girl and that a body had been found. At this point, Georgina's world was crumbling down. She refused to believe that her daughter was dead and tried unsuccessfully to Angela. She then posted again saying, Angela, answer me now, and then later added, that's my daughter. It took four days for Georgina to eventually be able to hold her daughter in her arms. She said in the interview that the trauma of losing Alicia in such a brutal and unimaginable way left her completely broken, that she wanted to join her in death. Her murder was bad enough, but then finding out that she'd been that had never crossed my mind. I can't even think about it now, I choose not to. When I do think about it, I imagine how she felt and what she would have been going through. She shouldn't have had to go through that. Alicia's heartbreaking funeral was attended by hundreds of people wearing pink, with her dad and uncle being amongst those carrying her little pink coffin into the hearse. Her uncle later gave an emotional tribute to the youngster, describing her as the brightest thing ever. Everyone called for justice to be done for Alicia, for the monster behind this brutality to be found and put behind bars. Then on July 4th, two days after the grisly discovery, police announced that they had made an arrest, but the suspect was not who they would have pictured. This is a vlog. I'm just here to talk. Uh, I'm first going to start off with subscribers on YouTube. Um, I've fastly had a little breaking point in the middle of nine subscribers where I slowed down and didn't get very many subscribers. Originally from England, Aaron Campbell moved to the Isle of Butte when he was around four or five years old with his mom, Janet, his dad, Christopher, and his little sister. There had been conflicting reports about Aaron's upbringing. While some reports say that he suffered from both emotional and physical from his mother while growing up, others contest this. But what we do know for sure is that Aaron's dad, Christopher, is a supervisor at an oil company and spent a lot of time away from home due to work, which left Aaron and his sister alone with their mother. Reports say that Aaron and his mom, Jeanette, would fight a lot, especially when she'd have too much to drink, which was quite often. Aaron was reportedly diagnosed with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD, and had a history of self-harming and depression. Despite this, Aaron appeared to be a normal kid and was even popular popular among his friends at school, whom he would always go out drinking with. He was a heavy drinker and pot user, and that was always seeming to get him in trouble with his mom. In 2014, Aaron started to post on YouTube, hoping to one day become a YouTube famous star. 
He started off posting gaming content, but soon began vlogging about his life. But there's something else that I did not mention that in hindsight would explain the heinous crime that Aaron would go on to commit. You see, while he seemed like a normal teen, Aaron was harboring some pretty dark and sick fantasies that he kept hidden from his friends. However, in 2017, this darkness would come out during a conversation with a female friend on Facebook. The two were chatting about a true crime documentary they had watched when Aaron reportedly said, I might kill kill one day for the lifetime experience. Sheesh, what a thing to say. The friend then asked him the chances of getting away with murder and he reportedly said, well, if it was a good plan, then 100%. Other messages said he would probably stalk her and go into her room. She then says, I'm glad I'm not at the top of your list. To which he replies, no one is. If that's not a red flag, I don't know what is. But this was not the only instance where Aaron's true nature revealed itself. In another instance, when he was 15 years old, he reportedly said that he was considering doing something excessive, such as his friends didn't think that much of it at the time and thought that he just had a dark sense of humor. But his dark humor would soon manifest in real life when he started setting fires and doing horrible things to cats. Yeah, that's one way of identifying a psycho killer in the making. If anyone can be cruel to an innocent animal, they're capable of doing anything. To top it off, Aaron was also obsessed with voodoo and the horror character Slenderman. His parents were understandably worried about their son turning into a monster. His dad reportedly even confided in some friends. His dad told close friends years ago his son had no empathy. He doesn't have feelings for anyone else. He was carrying a knife from the first year, and his mom had to go to school daily for a report on what he'd been up to. At one point, Aaron was entered into a rehabilitation program, but by now we know that that didn't help. The investigation into Alicia's murder began immediately, with the police in Scotland stating that every available resource from across Police Scotland is being made available to this major investigation. The detectives conducted searches at the McPhail home while heavily patrolling the streets of Butte and making house-to-house -house inquiries. Several parts of the island were cornered off while forensic experts searched for evidence. Investigators believed from the onset that the killer was still in Butte. But Butte had always been a safe place with the residents even leaving their doors unlocked. Could a stranger have entered their safe haven and committed this heinous crime? Or was there a wolf in sheep's clothing hiding among them? It was hard to believe someone they knew and probably even cared about would be capable of this. Alicia's family is utterly devastated um, by uh, what has happened and the, the news that we've had to give them this evening. We are continuing to provide support uh, to them at this moment in time. And again, I think it's, uh, it's uh, that aspect of uh, Alicia was a, a six-year-old girl who had started her summer holidays and I came here to spend a, a holiday with our relatives. As part of the investigation, the lead detectives in the case asked everyone in the area to check their home surveillance and report anything suspicious they would notice from that night. Jeanette Campbell, Aaron's mom, was very active in the initial search for Alicia. And in response to the police request, she checked the CCTV system she had installed outside her home. And what she found left her completely horrified. In the footage, Jeanette saw her 16-year-old son leaving and returning to the house several times from 1.54 a.m. to 4.07 a.m. on July 2nd. On his last trip, he appeared to have removed some of the clothes and retrieved a flashlight. Janet was understandably shaken. She did not want to believe that her son would be capable of something so vile and evil. There's no way she could have raised a monster. She wanted to believe that there was some sort of explanation for what she was seeing, and she confronted Aaron. Aaron assured her that he had nothing to do with what happened to Alicia, and that he was just going out to get high. Janet was satisfied with the explanation, so she decided to hand the footage over to the police, hoping that her son would soon be cleared as a suspect. But unfortunately for her, the footage did the complete opposite, and her son Aaron became the main suspect in Alicia's murder. But how did Aaron know Alicia? Why did he target her? And how was he able to get her out of the safety of her home? You see, Alicia's dad, Robert, ran a small illegal side hustle selling pot to people in the area. And his girlfriend, Tony, was in on it and would sometimes even bring him customers. 16-year-old Aaron was one of the regular customers of the couple until they fell out in February 2018 when he reportedly complained about the quality of Robert's products and refused to pay the debt that he owed Robert. After that, the two didn't cross paths again until now. However, there was one occasion where Aaron had almost run into Alicia and her grandparents, 
You remember when Alicia first arrived at the Isle of Butte on June 28th? She and her grandparents had spent the day at the beach. Two days later, Aaron and his friends had also gone to that particular beach to celebrate the end of the school year. It was while here that Aaron came up with the plan to throw a huge house party at his seven bedroom home. The following day on July 1st, the party went ahead with around 15 friends coming over to drink and enjoy themselves. Aaron would later recall mixing a bottle of Echo Falls wine with a fruity wine popular among teenagers called Mad Dog saying, I got drunk, but I wasn't sick. I was just having a good time. However, as the party came to an end at around 12.30 a.m., Aaron's mood changed after fighting with his mom for the majority of the night. Everyone had left the party, but one friend had to go back because he had forgotten his bag. Upon arriving, he remembers finding Aaron in an emotional state, saying that he wanted to harm himself. The friend stayed with Aaron for a while, trying to lift his spirit. And after some time, Aaron seemed okay and said that he was going to get some and then head off to bed. The friend then bid him goodbye and left. He would never have imagined the evil that his friend would unleash that night. Initially, Aaron was brought in as a possible witness. He was very cooperative and calm and answered every question without hesitation. He told detectives that he, Tony, Robert's girlfriend, have had a friends with benefits relationship since the winter of 2017. This, however, is believed to be false and the relationship between the two is reported to have been strictly business. Aaron denied having anything to do with Alicia's disappearance and murder, but admitted that he had been out that night drinking and smoking but later, when the police checked his phone, they found several suspicious activities, including a Google search in which he asked how the police found DNA. This led the police to conduct a DNA test on him, and they discovered that it matched the one found on Alicia's body and clothes. Aaron was arrested and charged with the abduction and murder of Alicia McPhail. But despite all the evidence pointing at him, he pleaded not guilty to the crime and even gave a really bizarre story, explaining how his DNA got on Alicia. He claimed that he and Tony Alicia's father's girlfriend, met in the middle of the night and hooked up. Then she allegedly took his DNA and planted it on Alicia after she had killed her. He claimed that Tony had used an implement to brutalize the youngster. When asked why Tony would go to such lengths to frame him, Aaron claimed that Tony was being a by Alicia's father and that she had murdered the little girl because she was jealous of the attention she received. Tony denied this allegation, saying that she would never hurt Alicia because she loved her to bits. She denied that Robert had ever abused her and that she had ever hooked up with Aaron. The trial began on February 11th, 2019, and chilling details of what actually happened to Alicia would soon be unveiled. After his friends left the party that night, Aaron called and texted several people, including Tony and Robert, asking if they were available to sell him. When his calls and texts went unanswered, Aaron reportedly decided to get over to Robert's house, which was about a five minutes walk from his house, intending to steal the from him. He took a kitchen knife from his home for protection and snuck out of the house. He was captured on CCTV at around 1.54 a.m. on July 2nd, making his way towards the McPhail's house to carry out his plan. When he arrived a short while later, the door was unlocked so he didn't even have to break in. He walked inside the house and went up the stairs hoping to find the stash of as he was looking around the house for it, he came across little Alicia sleeping in her bedroom, which was the closest to the front door. Now, instead of backing away and going on with his mission, this sicko saw this as a perfect opportunity to act on his dark fantasies. He would later confess that when he saw the little girl sleeping, he saw a moment of opportunity and that all he thought about was killing her. So he scooped Alicia from her bed in the dead of night and took her from the comfort of her home while her dad and grandparents were sleeping in their Rooms. All I thought about was killing her once I saw her. You told both Dr. McPherson and the social worker in some detail what you did. You said that Alicia was drowsy and became a bit more awake when you went outside. At one point she asked who you were and where you were going. You said you were a friend of her father's and that you were taking her home. The little girl was very calm, probably never imagining that someone would take her from the safety of her home with her dad and grandparents in the next room. She probably thought that her dad was with them or knew about this, so she trusted this monster when he said he was a friend of her dad. When she told him that she was cold, the sicko gave her his jacket, which might seem like a nice gesture, but it was really meant to give her a sense of false security. We don't know for sure if Alicia went back to sleep after that, but she certainly didn't put up a fight because she never thought she was in 
in any danger. In the next 30 minutes, they made their way out of the coastline of public view. This is where Aaron disposed of his knife, and around here, the pair were captured on home surveillance cameras, although the footage has not been released to the public. The journey would continue down the coastline until they reached a wooded area near an abandoned hotel. While here, this vile creature brutalized the defenseless girl and left her dead with catastrophic injuries. I can't even begin to imagine the pain and horror that this little girl must have gone through in her last moments. After taking her out of her bedroom and carrying her body all the way along the beach and up this hill, the 16-year-old left Alicia in these woods. She was found naked with her pajamas lying beside her and she sustained 117 injuries. The pathologist examining her body said some of them were unlike anything he'd ever seen. After leaving Alicia's lifeless body in the woods, Aaron left the scene and made his way back to the coastline, heading home. At roughly 3.35 a.m., he's picked up on his home surveillance camera jumping over a wall. It was Aaron Campbell's own mother who called police when she reviewed CCTV footage from their family home. It showed her son coming home from the woods where he had left Alicia's body. At quarter to four in the morning, he has a shower, then leaves home wearing only shorts and carrying clothes. Seven minutes later, Aaron Campbell returns, still only wearing shorts but no longer carrying the clothes. Six minutes later, he's changed clothes again and sprints out with a torch. At 4.07 a.m., finished covering his tracks, he returns to go to bed. His mother said he was sound asleep in the morning. Tony testified that when she saw Aaron's missed calls later that morning, she called him back to ask why he had called her in the middle of the night. But the teen did not pick up her calls, instead texted her saying, sorry, doesn't matter, with two laughing emojis. When she told him that Alicia was missing and to be on the lookout for her, he wrote, Oh damn, I'm sure she's not went too far, X. Then hours later, Alicia's body had been discovered. Aaron reportedly filmed himself in a Snapchat video, which he sent to a group of 25 people with the words, found the guy who has done it. Aaron's mom, Janet, confirmed in court that several items found at the beach after Alicia's death, including a fleece jacket, jogging pants, boxer shorts, a t-shirt, and a kitchen knife belonged to her son and came from her kitchen. Fibers from Aaron's pants were found on Alicia's discarded pajamas, and a forensic scientist testified that DNA matching the accused was found on the beach clothing. He also confirmed that a DNA sample taken from Alicia's neck had a billion to one chance of coming from anyone but Aaron Campbell. DNA matches were also found on Alicia's face, 14 parts of her body, and some of her clothing. The trial lasted for nine days, and the jury only took three hours to deliberate and find Aaron guilty of all charges. While giving his sentence, the judge called Aaron a cold and calculated, who had not shown a flicker of remorse during the trial. You went into the house and then her bedroom. You removed her from there and took her to a secluded spot where you visited and murdered her in the most brutal fashion. The details of that were revealed in the evidence and I do not intend to go over them again. It is difficult to imagine the distress which your family must have suffered. Because he was a minor when he committed the crime, Aaron received the minimum sentence of 27 years in prison, with the judge saying that he wished he could have given him more time because there is a low likelihood that he will ever be rehabilitated. As he was being let out of the courtroom, Alicia's family members could be heard shouting evil and beast. Alicia's mother, Georgina, called him a disgusting, vile little rat. At first, Aaron's identity was kept from the public because he was a minor when he committed the crime, and it's illegal in Scotland to publish the name of someone under the age of 18 who is accused, witness, or victim in a criminal case. However, the media in Scotland petitioned against this, and the ban was eventually lifted. The judge today uh, took into account that if there was ever a case in which he would should exercise his discretion to allow that, then this was it, given the extreme and shocking nature of it. And that was one of the reasons why the Scottish media uh, lodged the application in order to allow the murderer to be named. From Alicia's mum, Georgina. Words cannot express just how devastated I am to have lost my beautiful, happy, smiley wee girl. I am glad that the boy who did this has finally been brought to justice and that he will not be able to inflict the pain 
and another family he has done to mine. However, on September 10th, 2019, Aaron successfully appealed his sentence, reducing the minimum term from 27 to 24 years, meaning that he'll be eligible for parole when he is 40 in 2042. The three judges who ruled against the first sentence said that it was excessive for his age, though they agreed with the original judge that he might never be released. But if you thought that the story ends here, you're mistaken. Before he was sentenced, Aaron had reportedly confessed to his crime, telling a psychologist and a social worker that he was quite satisfied with the murder and that he was trying hard not to laugh during his trial. He said that he was mildly amused by the time the police took to catch him. A psychologist who interviewed him wrote in his report that Aaron continued to experience thoughts of killing and brutalizing young girls, as well as being intimate with dead bodies. Since his sentencing, Aaron has been disowned by his family, with his dad not wanting anything to do with him, and his mom being scared that she might be targeted for being his mother. In prison, Aaron usually stays locked up in his cell because he's afraid of what other inmates would do to him. But in June 2022, one inmate somehow managed to access his cell and give him what he deserved. The attacker was later termed a hero, with Alicia's great-grandfather being quoted as saying, I hope he's in pain. I hope he's suffering. The only thing that I'm sorry about is that I didn't get to do it myself. What do you think about this case? Should Aaron have gotten a longer sentence for what he did to Alicia? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section, and if you liked this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more.